Hello, I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, with our host, the Rev. Joseph Hinchy and Lisa Fertini Campbell. Now here's Lisa. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome everyone to the next episode in Duke and Altum. I'm Lisa Fortini Campbell here with the Reverend Joseph Henshi of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. Hello, Father. Hello, Lisa, and this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Well, today, Father, um, you are going to continue our journey out into the deep following the great Saint Peter. In our last episode, you developed um, a great deal of understanding of Psalm 130, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the three great penitential Mm -hmm. psalms, and you were helping us to understand its poetry and meaning, looking at some of the individual verses. Mm -hmm. So is that what you'll continue doing today? That's right. We'll try to finish up Psalm 130. (laughs) The explanation of it, the understanding of it, and the living of it would take a lifetime because it's so rich and so full of teaching. And it's true of all of these great psalms. Mm-hmm. I think one mm-hmm. of the reasons all of us love the psalms, mm-hmm. they, are, they are wonderful expressions mm-hmm. of our human cry for God. Each one seems to be a private visitation of a cathedral. It is. Oh, that's a lovely see. way. <laughs> a lovely way to say it. Mm-hmm. So before you begin, Father, will you start us off with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. And St. Peter, please pray for us all. In the name of the Father, Father, and of the the Son, Son, and of the the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Father, I'll let you launch off now. All right, so as we conclude these reflections on the magnificent Psalm 130 of going out into, from crying out from the depths, is the prayer of the church. And some believe that the depths of this particular psalm would have meant the Babylonian captivity it was coming to an end, and the pilgrims are on their way home to reopen the temple and or to build the temple anew. At any rate, if we could speak of the elephant of mercy, by that I mean there's a very evident presence throughout all of these prayers that God is merciful. No matter what has been done or what sin has been committed, any, any universal condemnation of God is not even considered. It's, not, it's never entertained because it would probably eliminate the first article of the creed from our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Well, it wouldn't be a very good father if he condemned everybody. So there's a great mystery of iniquity and a great mystery of God's mercy that are formulated by these psalms and presented to us as for our meditation and our conversion. So the supreme divine power and power of satisfaction is that of saving creation. The great saints assure us repeatedly that if a perfect heart cannot be found among believers that could rely on divine justice, then the imperfect hearts of all of us need to depend on God's mercy. There's no one that could go without the mercy of God. We know from that statement of Christ that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who comes back than over the 99 who have no need of God's mercy. And I think most of us in this spiritual life for any length of time would think that the the no those in need of mercy are ninety nine, and those who do not need it, whoever they may be or whoever he or she may be, would only be one. So, it, there is a beautiful reflection in the ordinary prayers of the Sundays throughout the year. For example, please, Lord, pardon all our sins, since our weaknesses render us captive of our sins. May your divine tenderness deliver us from it all. So this is a very strong idea of the mercy of God applied to the present need of any sinner. So the view expressed is that the in the depths the intensity of the hope of hope is like a flicker of light, or as the, the watchman looks for the new streaks of dawn. So prayer is that the intensity of the hope for salvation 
is always a measure of the mercy that the Lord will extend. As we've seen so many times, there seems to be an inverse ratio. The greater the need, the more is the mercy of God. So one's hope is ardent for personal pardon, and then these, in this particular case, whoever wrote this originally, it seems his or her experience was heart rendering, rending, and that the person found great faith and hope in the mercy of God. So in the magnificent prayer of Moses, the church of today can still derive a lesson of sublime hope as the way Moses prayed millennia ago. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 26 and following. And this is what we read. So I, Moses, fell prostrate before the Lord God, and I laid there for forty days and forty nights, the Lord God having said that he was going to destroy you. So I pleaded with God, Lord, do not destroy this people, your heritage, whom in your greatness you have redeemed, whom you brought out of captivity with your mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Take no notice of this people's stubbornness, their wickedness, and their sin, so that in the country from which you have brought us, it may not be said, you see, God was not able to save this wicked people, but we are your people, your heritage, whom you yourself have brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. So that's really a very deep prayer, fully trusting in the mercy of God. So hope based on faith is that the Lord watches over us. We are much moved by the Good Shepherd theme because we find that he would go out and look for the one stray or the one lost one. One can see here an extraordinary development of the understanding of hope and the living of hope in so many of these wonderful texts which developed in the New Testament times of the coming of Christ. They were given a much deeper meaning. Those who have recourse to him, whatever their sorrows are, whatever their regrets for their personal failures may be, whatever need for healing and strengthening in their repentant recourse to God, the prayer does not go unanswered. Such a mentality is antecedently assured of a favorable response to God. Every prayer in some way is heard. Maybe not always the exact way we would have liked as we pray in the Our Father, Thy will be done. So every petition is submitted to the will of God. So every impenitent is always encouraged to aspire ardently in an attitude full of confidence that they will be promptly heard and that they will be saved. This means that one should literally take a leap in the dark or a plunge into the depths, a jaunt into the unknown, and trust more in the mercy of God. So one question I have is, you're describing this notion of God's mercy, is that it seems to go back and forth between the saving of an individual person, Mm -hmm. an individual penitent who Mm -hmm. has sinned, and a people who Mm -hmm. has sinned. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's save... Save me, O Lord. Mm -hmm. Save us, O Lord. Mm -hmm. So Moses, in your Mm -hmm. example, is praying for Mm -hmm. all the people Mm -hmm. united, Mm -hmm. irrespective of the individual sinfulness of any one individual. And of course, when we pray to God, um, we are we are praying for ourselves um, often, but people we love. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk a little bit about about what is God redeeming here? Is he redeeming each of us individually or is he redeeming all of mankind irrespective of individuals? I, I guess maybe I could be more clear. There are so many cases where where one one suffers oneself or dies or is sick oneself. But God doesn't let humanity die. Mm-hmm. He, he lets, but maybe one person mm-hmm. not receive yeah. it. Well, it's, it, it is the problem, we might say, of Deuteronomy. In Moses' speech, there's a going back and forth between you in the singular and you in the plural. Yes. We find the same thing in the, in the Our Father. Forgive us our sins. So <clears throat> every one of us sooner or later will die. All of humanity will die, and there'll be a new creation, a new, uh, a new humanity, and so on until the end of time. So we pray as individuals, but we also pray not just to save our own skin. Hope is also motivated profoundly by charity. The Lord is going to ask all of us, where is your brother, where is your sister? So when we say, let us pray, 
that we ask for the entire church. But in so many of these prayers, this was a personal experience that was then generalized or nationalized. Because these people were believers, and in their great joy, they gathered an assembly for the temple and prayed together. So the Lord may allow, uh, does allow individuals to die. But from Christ suffering again in their death, he also promises them, and in some way the merits they have won by their suffering promises also that the power of new life, the power of resurrection, the power of pardon never never wavers and is never taken away. So I think a little bit maybe about a military context mm. where, where the soldiers who landed on Omaha Beach in the Second World War, mm. um, many of them individually died, mm. but that battle was won. Mm. Mm-hmm. As the remainders went went mm-hmm. up the bluffs and mm-hmm. and gradually pushed mm-hmm. the enemy back, so mm-hmm. the 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 individual struggle was lost, but the larger battle for yes, all of humanity. Yes, I, I think too. We could say every one of us has this personal, unique spiritual DNA, and we are redeemed the same way we were created one by one. <clears throat> but in our cre- creation, we were named members of a community, and that's the way we are redeemed. Because in the communion of saints, we're all together, even offering our merits, or if we think of the de Montfort devotion, true devotion to Mary, to surrender to Mary the precise intentions as we offer the prayers to God in this heroic act of charity. Whatever spirituality a person follows is the basic faith is God created us one by one, he redeems us one by one, but we belong to a communion of saints. So all of our prayers are, let us pray. Now, there might be a little bit of an exception with the creed, I believe. But in a certain sense, too, the creed is the prayer of the entire church. So it's, sure, we we are saved one by one and continued forever as members of the communion, communion of saints as their prayers in heaven still help us and our prayers in our struggles on earth still help the souls in purgatory. It's one church, whether still in pilgrimage, the church uh, suffering purification, or the church already glorified in heaven. But it's one by one as part of the communion of saints. So this particular word forgiveness used here in Psalm 130 is, they tell me, at least in the Hebrew language, rather unique, or it seems to go back to the Exodus antiphon. You, O Lord, are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, patient and rich in faithful love, you do not abandon your people. This is found in Nehemiah 9.17, but it's the old Exodus the antiphon of Exodus 34.6, O oh God, you are a God of mercy, slow to anger, rich in compassion. There are many, many variations of it. I think something like 50, but it, it must have been an ancient antiphon of the liturgy of the Old Testament times. Or we read in Daniel 9, O oh Lord God, we have sinned against you, and it is for the Lord our God, to, it is for the Lord, not God our God, to extend mercy and pardon since we have betrayed him. So there is this constant belief that no matter what we've done, if we try to come back, God will always hear us. He may not hear it just exactly as we have prayed, but that's why we do pray for loved ones, we pray for the church, we pray for one another, all of those following vocations, that they not be discouraged and not turn back because each one's contribution to the communion of saints is unique, just like there's no two identical snowflakes. Every one of them is remarkable when you think of it in an entire blizzard, and the many blizzards there have been. They never found two perfectly identical uh, snowflakes. So this Psalm 130 is a most sublime act of faith of the psalmist in the mercy of God. It's astounding to have this sublimity in the Old Testament. Whenever this happened, and maybe late in the Old Testament writing, but still, even before Christ, this is a endless preparation for the coming of Christ. Who we speak of the New Testament because it's new in its understanding of charity. Not only love your neighbor as yourself, but to love our neighbor as God loved his son. And also a new in- insight into the, into the existence of God. He's a triune God. There are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this psalmist, whoever he or she was, offers this sublime act of faith in the mercy of God. At the same time, it's a fervent prayer addressed to God, reminding him that he can save us 
And that's why we stress so much the memorial. Remember Abraham, remember Isaac, remember Jacob. Well, Jesus will eventually say to us, you do this memorial in memory of me, what I have done for you and what I ask now you to do for one another. It's simply a fact of human life that greater respect is shown mercy and magnanimity on the part of God to the little ones. This seems to be a, a divine preference, like whatever you do to the least of the brothers, you do to me. So in allowing his people to go from a life of sin to a life of grace, we are shielded by his, his mercy, and the pardoned sinners become adorers. That there is in this gift of God's mercy a great act of a new creation and a new beginning. So if this divine justice does indeed have to lash out against all offenders, there'd be no one left to worship him yes. in a very practical sense. In the depths of Sheol, there is little adoration offered to the Lord. And this beautiful Psalm 6 will sound familiar. I am worn out with my groaning, for the Lord God has heard the sound of my weeping, my pleading. The Lord God will accept my prayer. Sometimes prayer may be weeping or in suffering and agony, and we study in, in the, the different presences of Christ in the human soul where two or three gather in his name wherever there's one suffering or one who is tempted or one who has failed trying to find his or her way back. A beautiful Psalm 30. What point is there in my death? What difference does it make about my going down into the abyss? Can dust praise you? Can dust proclaim your faithfulness? So listen, Lord, take pity on me. God, I need your help. <laughs> These are most extraordinarily deep personal emotional prayer based on faith, hope, and love. Or Psalm 88, O Lord, you have plunged me into the very bottom of the grave in the darkness of the night, in the depths of the sea, kept low by your waves. I call to you, Lord my God, all day long. I stretch out my hands to you. These people know how to pray. And it seems that this is another human reason why these, why the Psalms have remained so vital in the prayer life of the church. If the Lord God does not come to my help, I will find myself dwelling in silence. I need only say I'm slipping. And the Lord reaches out to support me. So it seems that the logic of this psalmist is something like a Philadelphia lawyer. He's deeply a deep believer, and he has landed on a very decisive argument to arouse divine clemency in favor of himself and his people. For all who have been sinful, who are afflicted in any way, this psalmist is a perennial spokesperson. So all of us who are suffering the leprosy of sin or incompleteness or failure or whatever it is, we can find in Psalm 130 these sentiments expressed centuries ago, if not millennia ago, reaching out to us today that we can pray this way. It does seem like there is a kind of unguarded naturalness about this mm -hmm. psalm, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 an unfiltered cry mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. and, and we see this in so many of the psalms. It's mm -hmm as if we're almost getting to eavesdrop on the very private connection mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. has with God. And it, it encourages us, all of us in our own connection with him. It may be a corny uh, similarity, but I think of the Hubble, universe, the Hubble telescope that's only been flying around up there for 30 or more years. But look what it has discovered. And now the great scientists of our time have in mind of even deeper penetration penetration into the abyss. And the more they go, like one fellow said, after the Hubble universe, is just look at the treasures, 95% of which God kept for himself until just now. Just look at some of those photos that come in from outer space. Or I suppose when you look, when you are a scientist and look through a microscope, or some of these pictures they make of the wings of a butterfly or it's, it's an extraordinary reality of the power, the goodness, and the balance of God. So forgiveness is centered to the entire discussion. It's interesting, the old Franciscans and the old Dominicans used to have the argument, would Jesus have become man had there not been sin? And of course, the Dominicans following uh, Scripture said that Jesus means Savior, so their argument has always been that, no, most likely, 
at least under the present edict of the Lord, which they, the Dominicans leave open. Franciscans, however, have a wonderful point with St. Bonaventure and their great seraphic approach to Scripture, that uh, to God's Word, that the goodness of God is so great it just burst out to be shared, uh, be demonstrated to us in humanity. So he would have come anyway, whether there was sin or not. We'll have to leave that discussion to heaven. Well, you know, there is a painting. Uh, I won't remember right now in the mm. moment the the artist, but a me- medieval painting of the Garden of Eden. You know, we remember in that story in Genesis that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the evening. And this particular medieval artist painted God as Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so God, it was Jesus himself mm-hmm. walking in the garden mm-hmm. with Adam and Eve. So I guess maybe mm-hmm. that artist was a Franciscan. Well, it could be are a good biblical scholar because uh, the scriptures are written proleptically, meaning prophetically. They're always looking forward to it. Not at the past, what has been, but to the future, what still can be by the mercy of God. So we can understand then how forgiveness became a celebrated sacrifice. This is what most people need. They don't need a pat on the back. Most of us need total encouragement from weaknesses or failures or mistakes and so on. And what is sacrifice except one of the most exquisite acts of charity? We're told that in order to have a genuine sacrifice, St. Thomas Aquinas has the great idea, you have to offer up something really precious. You can't, for example, make a promise, well, I'll have supper tonight. Everybody would like to do that if they're feeling well. But to offer up something precious, well, we only have one life. So offer up this life by keeping the Ten Commandments is why Paul could write to the Romans in 12.1, make of your body, meaning your whole life, an oblation to the mercy of God. And that's really where it's at. We don't do this in fear and trembling, although we do realize that salvation is worked out in fear and trembling, as long as above and beyond all that, there is this understanding that God is rich in mercy. So the pouring of uh, innocent blood blotted out all the sins of the guilty. The simple reason is this is the blood of God. This is the, the blood of Christ, hypostatically united to the divinity. So so great a price was paid that all captives had been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. What you and I do as we work within the church, apply these great merits and graces that Christ has already won. Like Paul tells the Colossians in one twenty four. I offer my life to make up for whatever is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, nothing is lacking objectively, but what we have to do is to apply this to myself and to apply this to anyone with whom I come in contact. This is the great price, copiosa apud eum redemptio, and abundant with Christ is forgiveness. With the Lord there is propitiation. If there were not mercy with you, Lord, if there was only judgment, how could we ever, any one of us, survive in any way? But there's only one hope, and that's the Word of God leading us to everlasting life. So the law proved one guilty, and the law of mercy frees each and every one of us because the lawgiver is supreme power, and that power is translated as mercy. St. Saint John Chrysostom has an unusual idea of condescension. We've seen this before, but it would not be a very appealing attribute to have a condescending attitude. But St. John Chrysostom, great biblical scholar that he was, meant condescension is Christ descended to be con noi, to be with us, cum nobis, nobiscum. So we, we read these beautiful prayers, For your sake, O Lord, and that of your law, I have waited for you, O Lord. The Lord indeed condescended to bring me the law of mercy, to forgive all sins, to give future guidance, warning that one not offend in the future. This is the reason for all of this law of mercy. This is why the psalmist urges that all souls, like his own, wait for the law. Not a passive waiting, but an active perseverance in trying to live out our vocations and to develop, as long as we live, a life of prayer. So the idea is that God has 
stooped down mm-hmm. to our level mm-hmm. to rise, mm-hmm. bring us up. Gotcha. The way we often see an adult stoop <clears throat> down to the level of a child, to speak mm-hmm. to a child mm-hmm. eye to eye, mm-hmm. that's condescension mm-hmm. in the biblical in the meaning. In that sense, and that's, that's beautifully traced. And as you know, Hosea 11, 1, the Heavenly Father stooped down to give an infant something to eat. And it's one of the terms of the miserere, that the Lord has stooped down over this wounded person, much like a nurse bringing him or her some comfort in their fever, in their pain, and in their suffering. So if we only knew, we read in John 4, when Jesus met the woman of Samaria, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me something to drink, you would have been the one to ask and he would have given you the living water. Well, that's what we do. So these psalmists prepared the way for these wonderful requests, these wonderful expressions of hope in the Lord. So we read in Luke 19, Today's salvation has come to this house. The Son of Man has come to seek out, to save what has been lost. And probably one of the great lines is found in great expressions in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 19. For anyone with Christ, there is a new creation. The old order is gone now, and a new being being is there to see. All of this is God's work. He has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. I mean, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not holding anyone's faults against them, but entrusting to all of us the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. It is as though God, we're urging you through us, and in the name of Christ, we appeal to you to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made the sinless one a victim for sin, so that in him we might become the uprightness of God. That very mysterious Second Corinthians chapter 5, the sinless one became sin, or the one in Galatians, the cursed one on the cross has come to save us. <clears throat> well, this psalm then, begins to draw to a conclusion in verses 5 and 6. O God, I rely, my whole being relies on your promises. My whole being hopes in the Lord more than the watchman waits for daybreak, more than the watchman looks for daybreak. Let Israel hope in the Lord God. Well, a watchman worthy of his, 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 his muster looks for the streaks of the new dawn beginning. And this is so reminiscent of Christmas night when the shepherds were out on the hills keeping watch over their sheep and the angel of the Lord appeared to them. So we might say that what happens here by this flood of divine revelation, these wonderful expressions, hope participates in faith's inclination. So in that sense, we can speak of a certain hope. We really believe there's a God. We really believe he died on the cross and for the sake of all of us. We hope that all of that also means us, includes us. So we can say hope is as intense and as sure and as certain as faith is. So while we might speak of the darkness of hope and faith as we will as we go on in these reflections, like Peter went out and wept bitterly, but in that terrible agony there was hope that he would be forgiven. So in this segment, this final assurance of pardon, the psalmist reinforces his or her proposal. He not only emphasizes faith in the obtaining pardon, but he expresses a quality of supernatural faith which is its certitude. Faith makes known what God is through the communication of his word through the ages. And it gradually becomes clearer and clearer and clearer that in his attributes, mercy has a primacy. This was declared specifically by Pope St. John Paul II, who I think wrote the first encyclical in the history of the Church on mercy, and that this is a fundamental relative divine attribute toward humanity. The psalmist is simply convinced that the Lord God himself bends down over each sinner as a parent would bend down over a helpless child, as we saw in Psalm 51, or as a nurse and a doctor might help a helpless servant. 
God will condescend marvelously over the most poor of the poor, the sinner. So we see this in Psalm 102. The Lord God has leaned down from the heights of his sanctuary. He has looked down from heaven to earth to listen to the prayers of the captive, to set free those condemned to death. Or Psalm 113, who is like God? His throne is high above the stars, and he stoops down on heaven and earth. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy to give them a place among princes. So it's heady stuff, and it's sublime, sublime prayer, because we can learn a lot by God. We say today that the liturgy itself is its daily silent magisterium. If you really listen to the rituals of what is being prayed by the priest in our name, in every liturgy, especially in the Mass, we understand this more and more. So like with the entire church in this psalm, we pray out of the depths and we deeply believe that God will hear our prayer. This idea permeates everywhere. The psalmist is convinced that the Lord will indeed allow the supplicant to hear the joy joy and gladness. I've often thought in religious life, when there was a day I really wasn't too keen on praying, I would look around at my brother's and be always inspired and amazed by those who were really trying to pray their hearts out and trying to pray over their vocation from their presence in a very difficult time in church history. <clears throat> we see this reflected in Psalm 107. They cried out to the Lord God in their distress. He rescued them from their plight. He sent out his word and cured them. He rescued them from the abyss. Let them thank God for his faithful love. So the idea is the mercy of God flows out like the cloudburst into the desert and something comes to life. So the mercy of God comes down to us in abundance and brings about new life, as we see in, again in Psalm 119. These psalms really could be read and prayed and just noting where this idea comes to the fore. Your word, O Lord, is my hope. When will you have pity on me? You are my refuge and my shield. I put my hope in your word. I will observe the commandments of my God. So here I call with all my heart, answer me, O God, and I will observe your word. I call to you, please save me, and I will keep your instructions. I will be awake before the dawn to cry out for help. I put my hope in your word. My eyes are awake before each watch of the night to ponder your promise. We are meant to be the watchmen waiting for the new dawn the mercy of God coming to us in his infinite grace and pardon. Well, so I listened to you talk about this, and, and of course, as you describe this and read these this beautiful psalmic poetry, you know, I, I have an experience of getting it, seeing it mm-hmm. for a minute, and then I know in the next minute I'm going to fall right off the mm-hmm. rails and forget. Mm-hmm. I think about the Israelites who Mm -hmm. promised they would do whatever God wanted of them. Moses Mm -hmm. goes up on the mountain and immediately they go off the rails and start making golden calves Mm -hmm. and acting like -hmm. like, uh, sinful people Mm -hmm. again. So can you say a few words at all about how we can keep ourselves on the straight and narrow? (laughs) Well, this is the great miracle of Peter. On the one hand, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then when he was warming himself at the fire at some distance from Christ, I do not know the man. And he began to curse and to swear. This is the mystery of iniquity. And when we say that hope is a future good, difficult but possible, the mystery of iniquity is the difficulty. We have this daily struggle. And as I mentioned, St. Philip Neri, O Lord, put your hand on my head that I never turn away. But hope is possible because of God's mercy. The mystery of, of uh, the mystery of mercy, so the mystery of iniquity makes it all difficult. The mystery of mercy makes it all possible. Mm-hmm. So it's the dark night of the soul, as we'll see as we go on in these reflections. Peter going out into the night, and Judas going out into the night. They both ended up with different results. Judas ended up. <clears throat> it would be better if that man had never been born, and Peter is welcome back. Get behind me. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and be a good pope to by give this food and nourishment to the flock. And that's what we're doing here in our whole reflection of going out into the deep 
Peter takes us into the deep, not only dogmatically, but certainly spiritually. He was a great, great saint, and one with whom we really feel we have contact. We don't have the brilliance of Paul or the mysticism of John, but we do have the lumbering, fumbling <laughs> misunderstandings of Peter, and it seems to be one of the most lovable of all of the apostles. Well, I think one of the things that, that you are saying is something that has occurred to me too, that we keep, we need to keep turning, keep mm-hmm. converting. Mm-hmm. And, and I suppose sometimes perhaps it's a problem with our English language. The, 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 the life of faith would be better expressed using gerunds all the time rather than active mm-hmm. verbs that, mm-hmm. that we are not converted but always converting. Mm-hmm. We have not turned to the Lord but we are always turning. And if that's how we could see our lives... Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we would stay a little bit on track well, better. I think you're in very good company because in 1975, during the Holy Year, uh, Pope Paul wrote a beautiful letter on Evangelii Nunciandi. This is the, the gospel is to be announced, not my opinion, your opinion, anyone's. It's a gospel. And John Paul himself, as we know in Catechesi Tridende, the catechism must be handed on, but it can't be handed on unless we know it and live it. So we need contemplation, study, the teaching of the magisterium, and a lived experience. And this is the formula we all have constantly need in need of ongoing formation and ongoing pardon. The church is holy, but needs to be purified until the end of time. So the new image is the church, it's you and me, you and I, the watchman and the dawn. So the night watchman, from the divine response to the request of pardon, the psalmist proclaims himself to be assured of divine intervention. He really believes God is going to help him. <clears throat> this image so highly reminiscent of the Christmas story, the shepherds watching their flocks, is what God does with each and every one of us, and he wants this for us to do for one another. And where is your brother? Where is your sister? So we see this in Luke chapter 2. In the countryside, close by, there were shepherds out in the fields keeping guard over their sheep during the watches of the night. We like to think of the hierarchy as the good shepherd. But every one of us is asked to be a shepherd of whatever little flock we have under our own uh, under our own power, the people with whom we work, the people with whom we communicate, fellow parishioners, friends, relatives, no matter what the difficulties may be, maybe coming to know us would make Christ a little bit more real in their lives. That's what we all hope to do. So these are the sentinels, the ones who defend the flock like ramparts before a fortress. As we see in 121, the Lord God is your guardian. He's your shade. He's your right hand in which you find support. By day the sun will not strike you, nor the moon by night. The Lord God himself guards you from all harm. He guards your life. So this would be understood in the spiritual sense that we will, if we live out the mercy of God by using the language of that mercy, these beautiful psalms and beautiful sentiments of God's mercy. Or in Isaiah 21, From Seir, someone shouts, Watchman, what time of night is it? And the watchman says, Morning is coming, in Isaiah 21 and 11. But he's also reminded there will also be another light. My old teacher, Father Gary Goulagrange, used to speak of the ages of the interior life, to go from one level, like the 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 journeyman to the the apprentice, or the other way around, the apprentice to the journeyman, and eventually to the master, these three ages of the interior life, beginners, proficients, and those perfectly following it, are preceded by intense dark nights, of spiritual dark nights. So these beautiful prayers offer us an anchor thrown up into the sky, not down as we into the depths to keep us safe and, e- safe and easy. This is to draw us ever upward toward God. So these images really offer a sense of security, the belief in the unfailing protection of God. How deep is our faith? Well, that sincerely certain can also be our hope. 
The belief in the unfailing protection of God symbolized by the shepherd keeping watch or the fisherman keeping watch in the night. Perhaps in a way the psalmist has broadened this image in all that concerns divine pardon. There is the same assurance, the same impatience, the same yearning for renovation. It seems to be applied here that the flock would <coughs> need, will always need the watchful care of the shepherd and always be invited to offer their subservience and their following of Christ by following the word of God as revealed to us in divine revelation. So this entire magnificent act of hope-filled faith is a sublime expression on the part of an ancient, very repentant sinner whose words are still actual today. <clears throat> Any one of us could read this psalm and say, this guy's talking about me. <laughs> this is what I need. So the psalm manifests sublime trust in God. God will restore the broken friendship. The faith is simply this, that God will draw us up out of the chaotic abyss. Anyone who falls into misery, God will find him, much like the stray sheep. This omnipotent power that drew creation out of primordial chaos, the desert, the darkness, and the deep, the power of God's mercy will make this a garden of delight, the light of the nations, and the waters of baptism and new life. So in the New Testament, Peter has this experience. When he was in over his head, he asked the Lord to reach out and save him. He's sinking. He's also, he was also pardoned three times for his threefold denial, as we read Second Peter 1.19. We have confirmation of the words of the prophets. You'll be right to pay attention to it as a lamp lighting your way through the dark until the dawn comes and the morning star rises in your minds. Well, <clears throat> I'm not a, all that familiar with astronomy, but I'm inspired every morning looking out into that darkness just before the dawn. There's that bright light shining so steadily and so brightly. It's really fascinating. It seems to be somewhere in the east, but <laughs> it's not the sun and it's not the moon. It's a, a very round and beautiful star that's a reminder of all of this. So St. John sees the Jesus as the morning star as we read in Revelations, I am the bright star of the morning. It's interesting how St. Augustine took this psalm, great sinner that he was, lived in sin for many years, defied the, his loving mother's prayers for him, but in the end she won. So Augustine, when he commented on this, he said, My soul has trusted in the Lord from the morning watch even until night. The morning watch is the end of the night, but this does not mean to trust in the Lord only for one day. The verse seems to look forward to the time when the Lord will arrive at dawn on the third day, like the visitation of our Lord on Sinai in Exodus 19. We may all hope that after our life of Exodus on earth, what happened to the Lord after his conversation with Elijah and Moses, we too might raise up to eternal life. Jesus is the firstborn of a new creation. His resurrection is our fundamental hope. There are many antinomies here that are fascinating for the both literary scholar and the theologian. While it is true that all of our sins have been forgiven, we've not yet risen. All that had died in Christ Jesus arose in him. What we have seen in him, we now hope for in our own lives. The reason is that the Lord assumed our human nature. In some way, Jesus is united to every person, as we read in Gaudium et Spes 22. He received human life for us, that he might give us his divine life. He assumed our temporality, that we might assume his eternity. He took on our weakness, that we might participate in his strength. He assumed our flesh, that he might give us his spirit. He experienced death that he might give us life. So it's just a fascinating paradox on these uh, antinomies of the faith. The great uh, Cardinal de Lubac has written extensively on the antinomies of the faith and how they lead us to a much deeper appreciation. It's much easier to know what God is not than what he is because of uh, the analogies and all of these things that try to help us to understand this great mystery. Well, and the antinomies are a way of, of verbally expressing, as you say, something that isn't really describable by mm. words alone. It's mm. a, if, if I think about the imagery of, 
uh, a straight ruler mm. attempting to measure a beach ball. Mm. You know, it can only touch a tiny mm. amount of it mm. at any one time. Mm. So our natural language mm -hmm. is trying to express the beach ball of the mystery, and we're like, our language is like a ruler. We just can't mm -hmm. grasp it. And so mm -hmm. the antinomies help to bend the ruler a little right. bit. or mm -hmm. So that may be a way to think about it, like poetry does, mm -hmm. and perhaps the way the, way the parables did That's of Christ. Right. They were an mm -hmm. attempt to bend the language around something. There is a very laudable aspect of theology called symbolic theology. And these metaphors, these images that we have are really very, very helpful, like the dark night of the soul or the, uh, uh, the, the eternal life with perpetual light shining upon them. Anyone that's been in the desert, I had an experience once in South Africa. We had a mission there many years ago in the 1970s. And I went there with the Father General on a canonical visit. And while we were there, he had to go somewhere. And I was sitting outside in a car waiting for him to come back. And all of a sudden, all the lights everywhere went out. Mm. It was absolute pitch darkness. The whole city had lost town or village, whatever it was, had lost connection with the main line. Yeah. And that went on for an hour and a half. And Father had a very difficult time finding me. And I was, I was glad when he got back because he turned the... I didn't even know how to turn the lights on on this car. It was a kind of a different machine. But anyway... It was an experience, and how glad I was to see him come back. So I thought a little bit about the watchman waiting for the superior to come back so we could get the car moving again. So Jesus was consecrated and sent into this world like a great high priest to think of Christ or Calvary as a high altar of immolation. He's a priest offering atonement for our sins. We have offered him human nature, so there'd be no separation from priest offering and the host that is offered. In Christ, they're one and the same. As a priest, I offer a host and the wine, substitutes for the reality that will be made known in the consecration and eventually seen as it is. So Holy Communion with the Trinity will last forever, and this is really what our hope is. So in receiving human nature from ours, Jesus becomes a victim. Well, what does that mean for us? We too are called to be victims. As Mary said, fiat to the angel, we say amen to Holy Communion. May this host be done unto me. May I be bread that is broken and wine that was poured out. Jesus was made a holocaust and we are made to be an oblation into the hands of the mercy of God. In the resurrection, Jesus renews what was slain and offered this as the first fruit unto God. It's like we're connected to that new energy comes through us. The cornerstone has come to life and energizes these stones being built upon him. Jesus rose with the morning watch. From his rising at dawn on the third day, hope began in earnest. If he has not risen, we're the most wretched of human beings. Even into the night we hope. This means... We can eat, fall asleep in death and still live and die in hope that we too will arise at the dawn of the eternal day, the eternal third day of the Lord. We read in First Timothy chapter 1, Here is a saying you can rely on, again the certainty of faith, and no one should doubt this, that Jesus Christ came to, into the world to save sinners. And this is one of the strong arguments of the Dominicans saying that Christ came as Savior. Or again, Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm not ashamed because I know in whom I have put my trust. And I have no doubt at all that he is able to save God until that day, whatever I entrust to him. So this then concludes with the extraordinary manifestation of faith-filled hope and love. For with the Lord there is faithful love and with him generous ransom. Abed eum copiosa redemptio. So the underlying motif of all of this is a canticle of the infinite mercy of God. Within God, there is a divine will of ransom. We know this because that's the way he's been revealed. In fact, his son's name is Redeemer. The divine desire for the rehabilitation of the sinner is the whole reason for the plan of the second creation. The divine has said that Hebrew word meaning that faithful, strong friendship 
like between David and the uh, uh, the king's son, uh, in extent of intensity and time, it is everlasting. The only condition that God asks of those who would follow him is a demand to repent. And the king's son's name was Jonathan. David loved him with all his heart and because they had a very strong uh, friendship each uh, with the other. Or as we read in Psalm 51, as we've already seen, I know my offense. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. I have done what you see to be wrong. You delight in sincerity of heart. Turn away your face from my sins and wipe away all my guilt. Sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken, contrite heart. I offer to you, O Lord, and you never scorn. <clears throat> so this is really high liturgy. This is liturgy that has lived, as old St. Thomas would say, a genuflection externally indicated or manifested should indicate the interior act of sacrifice. The Exodus Antiphon, which we've mentioned a few times, is found in Exodus 34, 6, Psalm 103, verse 8, Psalm 145, 8. But you, O Lord, are a God of tenderness and mercy, slow to anger, rich in kindness, faithful love and loyalty. Turn to me and have pity upon me. Or Psalm 89, I will sing of the faith and love of the Lord God forever. From age to age my lips shall declare your constancy. For you have said, love is built to last forever. You have fixed your constancy firm in the heavens. So as you look out on the distant horizons at night, this is to remind us of the fidelity of God. Sunrise and sunset, as from the rising of the sun to the setting thereof, there was always a sacrifice going unto the Lord and he's always there, ready to receive it. So the final verse is the key of it all. He will ransom Israel from all its sons. So it's interesting to note that most of the individualistic psalms, <clears throat> those in which the deepest interior life of an anonymous individual is exposed, very often then are applied to the whole people of Israel. So many psalmists made of their own personal spirituality made of this a special application to the people as a whole. This is a clear indication of what is sometimes called the mystique of the covenant. Every one of us is a mosaic piece in this great covenant of God's mercy, very much alive and very much lived. So the individual in this canticle is then transposed to live on the collective level in order to instruct pilgrims better. So the Lord takes these gifted writers and enables them to have a very difficult experience, which they then wrote down almost as an autobiography without signing their document. And this then becomes a hymn that has echoed down through the long centuries right into our hearts this day. Or Psalm 25, My hope, O Lord, is in you. Ransom Israel, O God, from all its troubles. Psalm 69, God will save Zion. He will rebuild the cities of Judah and the people will live there in their own land. So what God can compare with you for pardoning guilt, for overlooking crime? He does not harbor, harbor anger forever since he delights in showing faithful love. This is found in Micah chapter 7, 19. Peter heard this following from Jesus himself. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways are not my ways, as we read in Isaiah 57. So the appeal that Jesus, the command that Jesus gave to Peter is, get behind me, follow me. And that's what the Lord is asking for each and every one of us. Of us. Matthew 1 describes all this. You must name him Jesus, because he is the one who is to save his people from their sins. Well, naturally, there is a great um, application of all of this in the New Testament. It would be enough, really, to study Christology to see how this is so fully realized. This is a central consolation of the Christian faith. The Lamb of God has entered human misery, and there is no depth of wretchedness that the divine mercy cannot fathom. Not too many years ago, there was a very interesting film that said Jesus stopped at Eboli. Well, Jesus did not stop with Israel. That was just the beginning. That was a foothold in the whole continent of humanity not only the humanity of that generation, 
but down through the centuries in some way Jesus is still con- united to every single one of us. So <clears throat> there is a very clear revelation of the mercy of God in all of this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, which we all are sometimes spiritually, my son, my child, your sins are forgiven. Which is easy to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or say, get up and pick up your stretcher and walk. But to prove to you that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, pick up that your stretcher and walk. And he would add, and come, follow me. So Psalm 130 indicates a new life, new freedom, new beginnings. It offers a fresh air of a hope-filled faith in the divine mercy. It inspires one to live anew the love of pardon, grace, and forgiveness. It inspires submission to a new law, a law of love, a law of mercy, which moves one to accept others no matter what their faults may be. This is a challenge to extend pardon, knowing that one has been forgiven so many times. And one of the measurements, as we know of divine mercy, is as we forgive one another. Forgive us as we forgive one another. It might be interesting to know that St. Augustine used this psalm three times in his confessions. He's most conf- convincing when he confesses to the readers of the, of the long centuries, of the depths of the abyss from which God saved him. The recitation of this canticle would remind, remind the great convert of the depths of his own misery, which the God's mercy simply swept aside to rescue him. So certainly, Psalm 130 is a psalm for these times. It's a period that seems to vindicate the wealthy, the powerful, having a false sense of security, whereas the Lord shows his interest in the poor sinner, those who are suffering, those who are downtrodden. The New Testament citations are many. In Titus chapter 2, he offered himself for us in order to ransom us from all our faults, to purify a people, to be his very own, and eager to do good. You might not be surprised that this psalm is used in the Christmas Vespers. It's used in the funeral liturgy, carrying away when the body is brought toward the cemetery. And it certainly is one of the great penitential psalms. So as we outcry out of the depths, let us also follow him and get behind him and persevere in his faithful mercy that we live a hope full of the sense of God's mercy. And this is what... Christian vocation is. I'll be with you all days, even to the consummation of your world. So that's a, our conclusion mm. of Psalm mm. 130 and mm. that, that great and beautiful psalm of mm. the triumvirate of the three that you've been discussing that helps us to come back. I mm. think mm. this is what you're saying over and over. God just asks us to come back, come back, to realize we're lost to cry out to him, and he will say, I'm here, I'm here. And the great paradox of the exultat on Holy Saturday, or happy sin that has merited such a redeemer. Yes. Well, I think of sometimes of a memory that I have of being a very little girl, maybe four years old, going shopping with my mother. Real this time in a big department store full of enticing things and lots of people. And at one point, I... I wandered away to go and see something, something. And then all of a sudden realized I was lost in the Mm. midst of all of these Mm. people. And you cry out, Mom! (laughs) And she said, here I am. Mm. And to put your hand back Mm. in hers at a time when Mm. you were suddenly aware Mm. how Mm. lost you were Mm -hmm. was a a wonderful return. And maybe that's the same kind of feeling. It seems to be that old creation story of the Lord reaching out pulling Abraham up out of the slime of the earth is really what he does in redemption, takes up out of the desert, the darkness, and the deep, and gives us new life. Well, so now yeah. we're going to begin, embark on a, on a new segment yeah. of Duke and Altum mm-hmm. in our next episode, mm-hmm. A Descent into the Darkness. Mm-hmm. And so before we begin this large segment, mm-hmm. we'll conclude today, and will you do it by offering a prayer? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. And St. Peter, please pray for us all. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for listening. And thank you for teaching, Father. 
Goodbye for now. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.